So hello, my name is Neil Sampson and I'm a senior user researcher from Westminster Council and this is my colleague Curtis. Hi there, uh, I'm Curtis Horn. I'm a researcher and intelligence analyst at Westminster City Council. And our talk today is about the approach that Westminster is taking to understand and tackle digital exclusion in the borough. So this is what we're going to cover in our talk today. So we're going to start off by discussing some of the issues faced by people who are digitally excluded and why we need to do something about it. We'll then explain what it means to be digitally excluded in Westminster. We'll then discuss the four steps that we went through to tackle digital exclusion and then discussing how we developed interventions based on customer segments and how we're identifying people who fall into those segments. So starting off with the, the beginning, so defining the problem, obviously a very important thing to do at the start of a project. So I'm sure you'll all be aware so that the, the hard edge of digital exclusion was very much starkly revealed in the uh, COVID-19 epidemic. So some of our residents were any, unable to buy food as they were vulnerable and needed to stay indoors. Some of, the, some of our children were unable to access school lessons online because they didn't have access to a laptop or the family laptop had to be shared across mum, dad, and uh, sometimes three or four children. Those people have always relied on accessing the internet in the community, so via libraries and other community assets were left without access. Grandparents were not also able to see their grandchildren growing up if they weren't able to use mobile uh, video, video messaging apps. Those that lost their jobs, uh, which didn't require IT skills, were suddenly faced with fewer opportunities and many felt unable to be able to use the internet to search for jobs or otherwise they lacked confidence in order to be able to move into rule, roles <clears throat> requiring even the most basic IT skills. And some of our most vulnerable residents were unable to access day centres and other activities which they and their family carers relied upon for personal development and respite care. Some of our businesses who did not have an online presence were unable to continue trading and in order to tackle these and many other negative consequences of digital exclusion, we needed to really develop a strategy in order to develop appropriate interventions. So digital exclusion is an issue that affects all areas of the UK. Uh, however, we needed to take a very much a localised approach to ensure that we're able to meet the specific needs of our digitally excluded residents in Westminster. A key catalyst and driver for Westminster was a strategy and vision for Westminster, which is to be a city for all. So therefore, by definition, digital exclusion is a fundamental barrier to Westminster being able to achieve these aims and optimise opportunities for all. And making sure that uh, inclusion and participation are the sort of the key drives to become a modern city with vibrant communities, thriving economies, and where citizens can have a great experience in living, working, and uh, being in the heart of London. And it was through this City for All ambition to make sure that no one was left behind that Westminster embarked on a major initiative to accelerate digital inclusion, uh, where digital exclusion barriers often impact the most vulnerable uh, residents in our communities. Digital inclusion is an important aspect which cuts across all of the four pillars of Westminster's City for All strategy. So greener and cleaner, vibrant communities, thriving economy and smart city. So, for example, if all of our businesses have full fibre broadband connectivity, they can operate in a far more effective way. I spoke to one business who had to rely on the goodwill of their employees to make mobile data use the contact machine, contactless machine. I also spoke to a falafel business in one of our markets who couldn't afford contactless technology and who was losing hundreds of pounds a week because of this, in addition to reduced uh, footfall from uh, the pandemic. Digital connectivity has a massive role to play in ensuring that our communities are vibrant places to live by connecting people with similar interests and letting people know all of the opportunities around them for participating in their community, whether that's volunteering, hiring a local handyman or having a coffee morning with someone. And developing vibrant communities is so important at Westminster because it's got such high levels of population churn as people move in and out of the borough. So just talking about, about the, the first phase of our work, which is the desk research. Uh, so it was obviously important to understand what data is currently available on digital exclusion, both at a local level, but also a national level, uh, and also to see what the gaps are uh, that may need to be filled. 
So we use lots of different sources of data on digital exclusion. So from the work that Lloyds Bank are doing on essential digital skills to the Office for National Statistics uh, to build a comprehensive picture of digital exclusion. And this infographic from the Good Things Foundation, I think does a really good job of explaining some of the national issues in terms of digital exclusion, some of the barriers faced by people who are digitally excluded, and also the impact uh, that the pandemic has had on exclusion. So I'm just going to pick out a few of the statistics here, which I think are particularly interesting and important. So there are nearly 15 million people who have very low digital engagement, which is almost a quarter of the population. And the people who are most likely to have uh, digital uh, use limitations are those who are over 65, people from low income households, people from uh, BME backgrounds. And also increasingly, the number of people who are digitally included has a very positive return on investment uh, in the UK. So every 15 pounds, every pound invested actually sort of has a redemption of 15 pounds uh, for every pound spent on improving basic digital skills. So it's a really, really good investment. It's also a really good investment from a, a sort of a social point of view as well, in terms of uh, people becoming much more connected to their community and, and grandchildren, etc. So in addition to the national sources, we also use our own surveys, such as our annual face-to-face -face survey, the city survey, to build a picture of the local nature of digital exclusion. So the picture was quite similar to the national picture. However, we were also able to identify areas where Westminster had particularly high levels of digital exclusions, which particularly was around uh, the most deprived areas in the, in the community. So uh, in the south, uh, it was um, Churchill, the ward, and in the north, it was uh, Church Street, where they were particularly badly affected by digital exclusion. So we're able to have a sort of a, quite a nuanced approach in terms of understanding exactly where digital exclusion uh, lived in the borough, I suppose. We also looked at uh, connectivity in the borough, and it was very clear that the areas where the highest levels of digital exclusion were didn't really correlate with the areas which had poor connectivity. And I think what this tells us is that interventions to improve connectivity won't necessarily have an effect on improving the levels of digital inclusion because uh, that wasn't really the, the issue. So it, it tells us that we need to do other things in order to get people more digitally included in the borough. So moving on to talk a bit about uh, phase two, which is our persona research. So the desk research was, was really useful in telling us who is most likely to be digitally excluded, uh, where they're more likely to live in the borough, but it did leave a few gaps. So it didn't tell us what the nature of digital exclusion was, so how it affects people uh, in their day-to-day -day lives. It didn't really tell us why people were digitally excluded. It didn't really tell us um, what could increase the likelihood of them becoming digitally included in the future either. So we therefore decided to do some in-depth interviews with both residents and businesses to better understand the, the real nature of digital exclusion and how it affects people's lives. So we used the national and local uh, desk research. Uh, we also did interviews with our service leads in Westminster to develop a series of 20 personas of digitally excluded residents and businesses. So these are based on seven groups who are more likely to be digitally excluded. So people already, re already receiving digitally exclusion services. Uh, so we thought it was important to understand how, how well or poorly they were servicing the communities they were intended for. Unemployed people, people on low incomes, uh, particularly low income families, homeless people, disabled people, vulnerable people over 65, and also micro businesses. So these are some of the, the main findings from this piece of research. And I think it won't be a surprise. The first point is that digital exclusion is often part of social exclusion. So we've seen already in the uh, the, the research that uh, some of the most deprived areas, also the most uh, areas with most exclusion in terms of digital exclusion. We also found that the timing really matters. So people need to be in the right circumstances to be receptive to digital inclusion initiatives. So for some of the people we spoke to, they hadn't really thought of digital exclusion as being a, an issue for them. So they, they weren't really, I suppose, in the market for uh, starting to look around for digital skills improvement or, or anything like that. So uh, the time really needs to be right for them to, to be sort of open to those sorts of ideas. 
Everything about digital needs to be accessible and easy to use right from the outset. Uh, it can be daunting enough, you know, learning a new skill and digital is, is no different. So making it as easy as possible is, is really important for people because they can be put off quite easily by strange jargon or things that don't seem to really make sense uh, from a sort of logical perspective. So making it really easy to use is, is so important. We also found that understanding the positive role that digital inclusion can have in people's lives is, is really, really important in terms of uh, motivating them to change their behaviour. So being able to sort of see at a very tangible level how uh, digital could, could affect their lives. So whether that's having conversations uh, on Zoom with, with grandchildren or being able to, to take books out of uh, the library, uh, you know, electronically and, and, and sort of listen to uh, audiobooks, that, that kind of thing, uh, really sort of brings it home to people, you know, what the benefits are for them. One of the other things, and we mentioned it earlier on, is, is the kind of, uh, the sort of sense of community and the opportunity that digital can have in terms of bringing communities together. And as, as I mentioned earlier on, there's lots of people coming and going in the uh, in the borough, which is which is great. But it also means that uh, people are starting, you know, having to start to to make connections all the time. And, and digital's got a really big role in terms of being able to connect uh, communities together. And I think it's also important to not underestimate the sort of the regularity of help that people may need to stay digitally included so it's not enough just to show someone once how to use a, a whatsapp call that you sometimes need to show them you know five or six times and, and you know, have to give them some prompts and some some information on how they can how can they do that in, in the future when you're not there to to show them how to do it because otherwise people stop doing doing things uh, and then they, they, they get frustrated and then they uh, feel embarrassed and uh, don't necessarily want to ask friends and family to help them there's also a lot of fear around digital uh, as well. So uh, people worry about not being able to perform digital tasks well. So they're, they're worried about, uh, you know, breaking the computer or software or mobile phone or uh, doing something wrong. They're also worried about uh, the impacts of some of their behavior. So, uh, you know, are they gonna find themselves open to, to, to abuse in some way? Are they going to pay the wrong person on, uh, on mobile applications in terms of banking. Uh, so there's lots of things that people very much fear about uh, using the internet. So for each of the 20 people uh, that we spoke to, we created uh, persona profiles. So we produced a, a short bio on them. <clears throat> we gave uh, an overview of their overall needs and goals, their frustrations with the internet, their levels of digital inclusivity, the skills that they needed to learn, uh, and where they are in terms of their behaviour uh, in relation to becoming more digitally included. So are they, you know, are they thinking about it? Are they doing something about it? Or uh, are they somewhere else? We also created a heat map for each of the personas. So the darker colours here are the areas where personas have more of a need. Um, so you can see that some of the people that we spoke to actually had, you know, multiple needs uh, of varying degrees. So that really tells us that uh, you know you need to have multiple interventions in order to, to help some some people it's not enough just to give someone a device or to give them some digital skills you often need to provide you know a, a whole kind of package uh, of tailored interventions in order to help people so this diagram is uh, the essential digital skills pyramid so this is, this is basically the higher you get up the pyramid the the more skills that you've you've got um, and the people we spoke to were typically at the foundation level uh, of skills, which meant that they've got the kind of the basic skills to be able to function in a digital world. So they can often send and receive emails or some of them can make video calls as well. However, to participate more fully and take advantage of the benefits of digital inclusion, participants are often needed to be able to develop life skills um, and also sort of uh, work skills as well to be able to, to get uh, access to jobs. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the participants we spoke to had no digital skills whatsoever. So that person needed to move towards uh, actually getting foundation skills. So in order to help uh, residents and businesses achieve their potential, we need to conduct a digital skills audit to understand where they are at the moment, what they need, um, and what kind of help they're going to need to achieve their potential. So whether that's getting a job or whether that's uh, being able to contact the grandchildren, everyone's need will be slightly different, I'm sure. 
So what we've done here, we've we've kind of got the essential digital skills pyramid, and then there's there's two pyramids kind of underneath the water line, if if you like. So um, underneath the water, people can basically can't really get a foothold in the digital skills pyramid uh, before they can get, you know, they need to sort of overcome a range of, of structural and psychological barriers in order to do that. So, so for example, one of the ladies I spoke to was living in temporary accommodation. Uh, she wasn't able to afford to pay her mobile phone bill. Uh, she'd been barred. Uh, and also she didn't have broadband and, and wasn't going to start installing broadband in a, in a temporary accommodation. Uh, so she had to go to cafes uh, to access it, the internet. So you can imagine how difficult that was uh, during the, the lockdown when uh, uh, a lot of the cafes were, were shut. Also spoke to a 75 year old man who really could see no benefit at all to him personally and being able to get access to the internet. I was trying to explain to him uh, all the different things that people, other people have got uh, the internet for and, and none of them were of any interest in whatsoever. So there, there's a wide range of both psychological and structural barriers to, to getting uh, to the point that you, you're even sort of uh, thinking about getting onto the internet. I've touched on this a little bit earlier, but in order to effectively achieve behaviour change, it's important to understand you know, where residents are in terms of, and businesses as well, in terms of their attitude to the internet. So the largest groups of participants were either at the pre-contemplation uh, or the action phases. So the pre-contemplation phase, so people haven't really considered becoming more digitally engaged at all. It's not something which they've even thought of and not something which concerns them or worries them. Uh, so for these people, it's really important to move them more towards the contemplation side of things. And this can be achieved by communication. So, for example, highlighting the benefits of becoming more digitally included. <coughs> and also at the contemplation and uh, preparation stages, uh, people are then at that point more receptive to initiatives that can help them become more digitally included, such as training, uh, access to devices, connectivity, etc. At the action phase, people are already taking steps to become more digitally included. So at this phase, it's really important to understand what's preventing them from continuing their journey towards becoming more digitally included uh, and stopping them relapsing. So by combining all of the knowledge of the type of people uh, that need the help, uh, where they are in terms of the behaviour, we can start developing tailored interventions that meet people's needs. So we now need to know how many people are affected by different aspects of digital exclusion so, and also how to find them. So I'm now going to pass over to Curtis, who's going to take you through how we're going to do this. Yeah, thanks very much, Neil. Um, so I'm going to talk about the mapping phase of the work that we did in a little bit more detail. Um, so as Neil mentioned earlier, um, we were able to use local data from our annual city survey to investigate the spatial distribution of vulnerability to digital exclusion. And our city survey product provided an indication of the extent of digital exclusion at the borough level. Um, but then we undertook a modelling exercise to try and distribute these figures more locally. And so by combining the city survey percentages with population estimates, um, both from the 2011 census and also from something called the low income families tracker, which helps us to identify low and in low income families in the borough. Um, we were able to estimate the number of digitally excluded residents in each ward that could be accounted for by older age, by poor health and also by deprivation. Um, and we were able to make some adjustments to convert households to residents and um, ward totals were then created by adding those numbers from each of those three factors together and then constraining it to the overall digitally, digitally excluded um, borough total. Obviously, those factors aren't mutually exclusive. And so whilst undoubtedly there were other factors that were associated with digital exclusion, um, the total number of residents that was estimated from this approach accounted for about 98% of the borough total estimate. So what that suggests simply is that old age, poor health and deprivation were key explanatory variables. Um, and this map is available at a more granular level internally, so we can drill down a little bit more and see where those most vulnerable areas are. So what we also did um, as part of the London Office for Technology and Innovations COVID Innovation Fund, um, we partnered with four other London boroughs and also the GLA to develop an interactive pan London map of vulnerability to digital exclusion. 
Um, so this map's based on a wide range of open data sets that can help users to target specific vulnerable groups or areas in their boroughs. And so by combining that national open source data with local data, um, it's possible to better understand which groups are most vulnerable to digital exclusion, um, where they are in particular in the borough. So for example, in Westminster, we combine that open data with both commercial socio-economic data and also with that low-income family tracker data that I mentioned to provide a much more granular analysis at street level. And what we also did was um, we begun the process of creating story maps for specific vulnerable groups. So these are designed to help decision makers um, when they're creating and targeting their initiatives. And so this is just an example of the process in Westminster for over 65 vulnerable residents. So um, here we built up various layers based on the spatial distribution of those over 65 and over 75. Um, we also looked at um, where the highest levels of deprivation were. So we used the index of multiple deprivation for that, as well as our low income family tracker data. Um, we also looked at Ofcom not spots. So these were areas that were receiving less than uh, 30 megabits per second uh, broadband. And then we also looked at language barriers as well, um, where people didn't speak English as their first language, because from our city survey, we discovered that that was also a factor. And then by combining all those metrics together and then layering on the community assets that we had, um, we can identify target areas that satisfy multiple metrics for this particular cohort um, and then see, you know, where's the nearest library or community centre where we can start to run some of these interventions and help these people that need it most. Um, and so the idea is to repeat this process for different vulnerable groups. Um, so, yeah, this is a really useful resource. So. Um, moving on, having done the mapping, we were able to identify where the most vulnerable areas were. Um, we'd done the persona research, so we had an idea of the softer aspects of digital exclusion, um, but we didn't really know the extent of those softer aspects. You know, we wanted to quantify, um, you know, how many people are experiencing different types of barriers and, and, you know, what else could we learn? So we commissioned a uh, survey. So. What we did was we interviewed over 800 residents from four key digitally excluded groups across both Westminster and also the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. So this was a collaborative survey and we wanted to try and better understand the challenges, the barriers and also the potential motivators to becoming digitally included. Um, so the groups that we targeted were those over 60, um, those with a disability or caring for someone with a disability unemployed residents and also low income families. And as I said earlier, these groups aren't mutually exclusive. So that meant that we had quite a decent sample size across all four of those groups. And the survey itself was, uh, was uh, designed in collaboration with five partner boroughs um, with the London Office for Technology and Innovation and also other external charities like the Good Things Foundation. Um, and it took place throughout June in 2021 and it targeted those vulnerable resident groups that were identified by our persona research and data mapping. So it was very much evidence led. And the really great thing about this was that the map of vulnerability to digital exclusion that we'd created was actually instrumental in finding eligible survey respondents. So the map was actually used to direct interviewers to specific output areas across both boroughs. Um, and the research company were initially a little bit worried about finding some of these harder to reach demographics, but they were very effectively able to target and engage with those vulnerable groups. So that was a really good validation exercise for the mapping. It shows that it's a useful tool and it can help local authorities to find and engage with their digitally excluded residents. And so what I'm going to do now is just run through some of the key findings from that survey. So. First thing to say is that more than a third of respondents actually said that they didn't access the internet in the last year. And remember, this is just across those four vulnerable groups that we identified, not across the whole population. And of these, only 2% had taken steps to help them get online. Um, and approximately three quarters weren't even thinking about accessing the internet in the next year. Almost two thirds said that they had no interest in using the internet and that nothing would persuade them to use it. So this again links back to what Neil was saying about that pre-contemplation behaviour stage. And in particular, this was most prevalent in those aged over 60. 
Um, and in fact, it was the over 60s that were most likely to lack digital skills and to not think that they needed them. So there's definitely a need here to raise awareness of the benefits of accessing the internet to this group in particular. We move on. Um, other than a lack of interest or awareness, the most prevalent barriers to using the internet were a lack of confidence and skills. So more than a third of internet users said that they were not very or at all confident in using the internet. And even in those who said they didn't lack confidence, half still admitted that they had some gaps in the skills that they need for their personal or work life. So just having the ability or the infrastructure to get online isn't inclusive enough. Uh, we need to be providing skills and training that's going to result in the most positive outcomes. Uh, free devices and connectivity will work for a small minority, of course, but other initiatives, as I said, are going to be required to encourage digital inclusion. So approximately one in 10 non-internet users said that a free device would most likely encourage them to use the internet in the future. Uh, over a quarter of non-internet users said that they had some interest in using the internet, but it was the cost, um, it was the equipment needs that outweighed the advantages, particularly amongst unemployed people. Uh, and so again, this emphasises the point that other initiatives focusing on those soft aspects are going to be required to encourage digital inclusion. In terms of motivation, uh, across all four groups, social activities were by far the most important perceived benefit of accessing the internet. So in contrast to that, less than one in 10 people um, who didn't use the internet said that accessing information was the most important to them. Um, very few, 3% uh, wanted to use it to contact organisations like the council. And then amongst those that were using the internet, one in 10 said that they'd use the internet for things like council tax or other local services in the past three months. Um, so again, this might link back to a lack of awareness and understanding of what's possible. So in terms of how we can actually intervene and help residents to become more included, Two in five respondents said that they wanted help from friends and family, and this was by far the most popular answer by a long way. Um, and so it emphasises the importance of, you know, us supporting friends and family to help their loved ones learn digital skills. However, it has to be said that the majority of respondents that we interviewed didn't ha have any children living with them. So perhaps in this case, the owner should be on peer support. In terms of interest and willingness to get online and to develop skills and confidence, uh, unemployed people and those on low incomes seem the most likely to benefit from having access to the internet. So we also assessed confidence at the household level um, and unemployed people are more likely to need outside help because a greater proportion of them lived in a household where at least one other person didn't have uh, good digital skills. And by comparison, low income families were more likely to have at least one confident user in their household. So perhaps this is something that could be leveraged. Uh, interestingly, one in five respondents also used the library for accessing the Internet. Um, and so this supports having digital skills training in libraries. Um, and in particular, unemployed respondents were more likely than average to access the Internet in a library um, or a community centre or public place. Uh, and this aligns with the fact that they are less likely to have that confident user in their household. So I think we're starting to build an int interesting picture here of how we might um, tailor our interventions for these different groups. And then finally, um, probably the statistic that shocked me most, um, only 13% of unemployed people said that they use the internet to apply or search for jobs. Um, so this shows that to me, unemployed people perhaps lack that awareness of how digital can really help them in getting a job. A job, um, And we need to think about how we can do more to raise awareness of that um, and raise awareness of the opportunities that are open to them. So that was a very high level kind of summary of the survey findings, but we wanted to take this a step further um, in the form of audience segmentation, um, particularly based on the barriers that non-internet users face. Um, you know, are there particular segments that people fall into and can that help us to better target our initiatives? And so to do that, we use something called data driven segmentation um, and we grouped survey respondents into naturally existing segments based on their shared barriers to accessing the Internet. So we use the barriers that were listed in the survey as segmentation criteria. And then we use something called unsupervised machine learning, um, a K-means clustering algorithm to 
group respondents based on the similarity and the closeness of their responses. And then the segments were characterised according to the barriers that their members were more likely to encounter compared to the overall survey average. And then we further describe those segments by crossing them with other demographic and socioeconomic variables, so things like age, household income and employment status. And then these segments were used to identify those different forms of digital exclusion um, and they provide a really valuable evidence base for decision making and for targeting our initiatives. So I'm going to run through what those segments are now. So just for context, uh, the graph on the left there uh, shows all the potential barriers to digital inclusion and the shaded bars indicate the barriers that members of that segment are more likely to encounter compared to average. So here you can see that this segment is really strongly characterised by people who have no interest in using the internet. And so this is the segment we term not for me. Um, and just to go through some of the defining characteristics of this segment. So this was the largest segment of non-internet users. Um, all members of this segment had no interest in using the internet. Um, it consisted predominantly of older residents, so 86% were over the age of 65 and almost half were over the age of 75. And the majority said that they weren't planning to access the internet in the next year, and more than four in five, unsurprisingly, felt that they didn't need to learn any skills in the future. Um, and as you might imagine, over half said that they saw no benefits to accessing the internet. The second segment is what we term reliant on others. So these are people that either have impairments that make it more difficult for them to get online. Um, they tend to get someone else to do what they need um, and they find the Internet overly complex. And almost a quarter of people fell into this segment. Um, and men members of this segment were less likely to face other barriers associated with things like cost or lack of equipment. So we know that it's not down to that. And almost one in five had children living in their household as well. So that ties in with the fact that they tend to get help uh, when they want to do things online. And almost half said that they'd like to just develop some basic skills. So things like sending and receiving emails, but nothing more advanced than that. So nothing like internet banking uh, or even staying safe online. Uh, next, we have the unconfident segment. So as the name suggests, these are people that lack confidence or they have uncertainty or a lack of trust in using the Internet. And so all members of this segment felt that they weren't confident in either using devices or getting online. Um, over a quarter just didn't know where to start with it. Um, and almost two in five were worried about making mistakes or being taken advantage of. Almost a third also said that getting more support from someone to help them get online would encourage them to use the Internet in the future. And interestingly, a lack of confidence transcended demography. So by that, I mean that there are very few demographics that were over or underrepresented in this segment. Um, one that was was um, those that were non-registered unemployed seeking work. So approximately two in five uh, people fell into that category. Uh, we next have the low income and confidence segment. So this is a segment that uh, faces multiple barriers. So um, they struggle with a lack of equipment, um, they have low confidence, they feel that the internet's overly complex, and they also find that the high cost of devices is a barrier for them as well. Um, approximately four in five, so the vast majority in this segment, had a yearly household income of less than £10,000, so these are very low income households. And the majority were in NRS social grade E, so non-working, and approximately two in five said that they were not registered unemployed seeking work. And almost a quarter of people in this segment would like help from a council service such as adult education or other learning provider to help them get online and develop the confidence and get the access that they need. And then finally, we have what we term the financially constrained segment. So this was the smallest segment, less than one in 10 people fell into this segment. Um, and the main barriers for these people were high costs of data and high costs of devices. Um, so almost one in 10, interestingly, as well, said that English as a second language was a barrier to accessing the Internet for them. Um, and almost half said that a free or low cost Internet um, access or low cost device would encourage them to use the Internet in the future. Um, and once again, just over half said that they'd like to just develop very basic skills. So things like sending and receiving emails, but nothing more advanced than that. So having 
discovered those segments, understanding the different types of barriers that people face, we now need to use those to turn insights into action and provide tailored solutions. Um, so the segments, as I've said, they've helped us to identify those different forms of digital exclusion. They've provided a really valuable evidence base. And now we can start to think about the different kinds of things that we can do to help people in each of those segments. So I'm not going to go through each of these in detail, but just to give an example, if you consider the not for me segment, these people, they really need to be shown the tangible benefits of getting online. Um, they're going to require numerous types of interventions. So not only free devices and connectivity, but also ongoing face to face support so that they can get that kind of reinforcement that they need um, and preferably from friends and family as well. And you know, that shows that we're going to have to target that support to friends and family to really help people in this segment. Uh, and importantly, non-digital solutions and incentives are also going to be required for that group. So we can start to think about how these different characteristics for each of those segments um, can, you know, help us think about our interventions in a more applied sense. Um, you know, what, what does that actually mean in reality? Um, so off the back of that, we've kicked off a range of initiatives that aim to cater for all these different segments um, and try to overcome the different types of barriers to becoming digitally included. So as I said, really trying to turn those insights into action. Um, so there's a, a huge list of things that we're up to on the screen here. I'm not going to read through all of them, but just as an example, um, when it comes to building confidence and skills, um, you know, we're trying to train our frontline staff and our voluntary and community sector partners to um, use those persona based um, pieces of research to recognise the kinds of interventions and help that people need and developing different learning packages depending on the segment. Um, in terms of motivation and trust, as I said, we're trying to engage family and friends to introduce the benefits of getting online to people because um, I think that's definitely the best route and that was something that was consistent across all segments. Um, if we move on things like connectivity, so um, we're trying to make sure that we provide free connectivity to support, support uh, homeschooling, making sure that um, our digital street markets are all connected to Wi-Fi. Um, and then in terms of devices, you know, we've provided over a thousand laptops uh, so far. We're trying to donate laptops to vulnerable families and schools. And that segmentation has also helped us to identify who needs those devices the most as well, so that we can be efficient with, with how we're distributing those. And then one thing that we're really excited about is that um, we we need to make sure that we pair people with the right initiatives depending on their needs. Um, and so the segmentation, that's really useful in this regard. Um, and here particularly, we want to make sure that every contact with the council counts. So we developed a, a series of golden questions based on the segmentation analysis. Um, and these questions can help us to quickly assess residents who need digital support. They allow us to identify those resident needs really efficiently um, and they help us to direct, direct them to the right kind of help. And so to do this, we're going to be piloting these golden questions in our housing contact centre and our housing community centres. Um, and so hopefully what you can see here is that from start to finish, this entire process has been evidence led, again, turning all these insights into action, something tangible that we can really make sure we're making a difference uh, for our residents with. Um, and then finally, um, this is just an example of some of the, the things that we're doing to match our initiatives with segments. So um, this is by no means an extensive list of what we're up to, but you can see once we identify the segment that people fall into, how we can then begin to match those people with the different types of initiatives that we're going on so we can be super efficient, super effective um, and tailor those interventions so that people get the right help um, and they're, you know, they're designed to kind of make sure that we're not giving too much resource to, to one area or too much resource to another. Um, we're being really efficient because, you know, a lot of councils are being squeezed at the moment, as you know. So, you know, this is really important use of data to try and make sure that the people are getting the help that they need in the most efficient way possible. Um, so just to wrap up, um, I appreciate we've covered a lot there, um, but the one constant I hope you've seen throughout is that um, we've taken a really evidence led approach to inform our decision making um, from the desk research to the persona creation, um, the mapping work to the segmentation. Um, we've begun to build a really robust picture of our residents uh, needs in relation to digital exclusion. 
and ultimately these insights are helping us to tailor our interventions in the most effective and efficient way possible so it's benefiting both our residents our businesses um, as well as the council and beyond um, so that all that remains to do is just to give some thank yous and um, you know this has been a truly collaborative effort um, obviously myself and Neil have presented today but um, you know this work is collaboration with departments and service areas across the council so thanks to all involved um, also thanks to the London office for technology and innovation for their support and contribution to the research um, to Brent Barnett RBKC and Southwark councils as well for partnering with us and a lot of this work um, and also to the GLA for their help in developing and hosting the Pan London map uh, thank you very much